What's up, guys? Welcome back to Punch Card Investing. This is a new segment called Contrarian Corner. My name is Mike Sharp, and I'm going to do, be doing a monthly segment here looking at stocks that I believe are unloved, hated, and they may have a chance to turn around over the next two to five year period. Now, I should mention first what I believe a contrarian pick is. Now, first of all, usually the price is down. Obviously, that's the obvious one. But a lot of the time, you're going to get very negative sentiment or you're going to have something that's totally ignored by the market. And oftentimes, what I'm looking for is a company with a problem that is that I view as temporary, but the market is pricing it as permanent. So with that in mind, let's look at the first pick of the segment, Liberty Global. All right, well, on with Liberty Global. Uh, what is it? I did a quick overview of it on my channel, which is Sharp Investing. So if you're interested in uh, some of the other stuff that I do, please check out that channel. But I have not done a full analysis yet, so I thought I'd do it here on Punch Card. Liberty Global is a global tele or sorry, a multinational telecom company in Europe and the UK, and it is part of the John Malone complex of companies. He owns 25% of it. And if you don't know him, he was featured in the book, The Outsiders, as one of the great uh, cable barons of the 80s and 90s. So if you haven't read that book, I suggest reading it. It's quite a good read um, if you're an investment nerd like me. Okay, so Liberty Global has a few different types of shares. And as far as I can tell, they're just the, the difference is just the voting rights. So uh, I personally don't uh, care about the voting rights because I'm such a small investor that it's almost irrelevant to me. Uh, but I have bought the A shares. Um, disclaimer, I did buy this company at $17 on the A shares. So I am biased. This is not investment advice. Um, but for me, the share didn't, the shares didn't really matter that much what, what, um, what class of shares I was buying. So, and I guess I would go into why is this a contrarian pick, right? So if we look at the long-term chart here, you'll see that from 2015 until now, the, the price has basically just been coming down consistently from about $52 to where it is now uh, at about 1850. Okay, so that was that's only half of the story though, because in that same time, the number of shares outstanding has gone from 900 million to 450 million. So the market cap has actually collapsed even more than the stock price it appears to on the chart. So in 2015, the market cap was around $46 billion. Now it's just over $8 billion. So it's lost about 83% of its share value. And the reason that is, is because, well, I think mostly because there's no growth left in this company. It's essentially just a boring cash cow. People are worried about uh, customers cutting the cords on their cable and stuff like that. Um, so it's really gone into the hated pile of the market. And right now you can buy it very cheap compared to what the actual cash flows are, which we'll go into in a minute here. So I mentioned John Malone, who owns 25% of the company. Seth Klarman actually owns 9% of this company, and it's about 16% of his portfolio. Uh, he owns 47 million shares. So I'm not really a guru follower myself too much. Like I keep an eye on them, uh, but I am very interested when they put a big chunk of their portfolio in anything, right? So if I see this kind of conviction level, uh, it makes me think that there's maybe something to this. And um, that's initially the thing that drew me to, the, to looking into this company. And like I said, it's 16% of Seth Klarman's portfolio and it's his biggest position. So that indicates to me that he really thinks he's got something here. All right, and the company structure is they have four major pieces to their business. They have, let me look here, Sunrise in Switzerland, Telenet in Belgium, Virgin O2 in the UK, and Vodafone Ziggo in the Netherlands. Now, those aren't all held the same way. Now, the first two, Sunrise and Telenet, are owned directly by Liberty Global, and the other two, Virgin O2 and Vodafone Ziggo, are actually 50-50 partnerships with other companies. Um, so when you look at their financial statements and their their uh, presentations and stuff, it's a little bit confusing because the partnership stuff is pulled out to the the edges and you have to kind of do some work to figure out what the actual financials look like. Some other notes on this company are that uh, they they don't have a lot of 
organic growth available. Now, part of the business is growing. The mobile, the mobile side of their business is growing, but something like cable TV and the services like that are shrinking. So the net of both of them is you get about a, a flat sort of growth rate in terms of revenue, but they do tend to grow fairly often actually via acquisitions. So they have a strategy where they'll buy, grow, and then sell these companies. So at this point, you know, I'm not going to go through all the acquisitions and dispositions, but if you look back on historical financials, part of the uh, thing you have to do is sort of account for these these acquisitions and dispositions because it it can create an, an incorrect impression of the underlying business as they do that. Okay, let's take a quick look at the financials. Now, they're pretty complex if you start uh, digging into them just because of all the partnership um, stuff and the direct ownership stuff with some of the subsidiaries. But I'll just look at some of the uh, main things high level here. Now, if we look at revenue, uh, this is the 2020 financials or the presentation actually. And you'll see that across the board, it generally comes in around flat. So there's not a lot of organic growth here. And if and as the if we look at the breakdown, the consumer fixed. So that's your cable, uh, your phone lines, stuff like that. And we all know that that stuff is on the decline. But the the truth of it is, people are still going to watch TV. They're just watching it in a different way. There which means they need probably need broadband or a good mobile plan in order to do that. So they're gaining on that side. Uh, people are just changing their behaviors. Uh, now, I don't personally see a lot of risk with uh, broadband and mobile because I don't think there's a lot of technologies that can overtake them. I mean, maybe someday the satellite stuff will be uh, cheap, uh, cheap enough and fast enough that it'll take over. But right now, there's, there really isn't, if you want speed, there's really no um, comparison to having a fixed line, you know, broadband connection in your house. So revenue is flat. Uh, if you look in 2023 year to date so far, first half, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, revenue is flat. But one thing that they did do, um, which may provide a little bit of a tailwind here, is they've actually taken all their prices up across the board in the first half of 2023. And they, the company says that those haven't taken effect yet, and they expect the effect to come in the second half of 2023. So we might see a little bit of revenue uh, growth in the second half. Now, they did lose some customers here uh, in, in quarter two because of the price rises, uh, but the way the the industry works, it's it's fairly rational. I mean, people are not, uh, the companies tend not to start price wars because they've all spent so much money on CapEx just wiring all these houses up that they don't, there's not really a lot to gain by trying to, um, you know, cut prices to gain share. Because if you're gaining share and not making any money on it, it's, it's not that useful. Then you eventually have to put the prices back up it might go back to the competitors. So it's a, it's a bit futile to start a price war in this, um, in this segment. And so that's why I think that there's, you know, there's some safety here, right? It's, it's sort of an oligopoly type situation where the competition isn't, isn't uh, being super cutthroat. One of the other things that they're doing to improve the churn or decrease the attrition rate of their customers is they're really focusing on these fixed mobile convergence, which means basically that you, um, you know, if you have a mobile plan with them, you get the broadband cheaper or the other way around. It's the same thing. And I think uh, most of us have had that experience now as most of these telecom companies are trying to do that. But ne needless to say, there might be some revenue growth coming, but I don't really think that that's going to be um, a huge catalyst here. There's some other catalysts. What else do I want to talk about? Okay. The debt uh, debt's very significant here. Like at the, they have 13 billion in debt. It's actually more than that if you include the partnership level debt uh, with Virgin O2 and Vodafone Zigo. So, so the enterprise value here, what, what was the numbers? 21 billion, right? So, you know that's not great compared to a eight billion dollar market cap. Um, but I think we need to look at some of the comparisons to the cash flow first. So. Uh, they have a specific cash flow uh, metric that is uh, the most useful for them. They call it distributable cash flow because basically what they do is they are taking all of their excess cash flow after they invest in their uh, their their upgrades to their networks and their capex, and they call it distributable cash flow. 
and they take all that and they basically send it to the the shareholders via buybacks. So last year the DCF was just over 1.6 billion. The previous year it was 1.3 billion and so far the projection in 2023 is 1.6 billion. So that number is staying about flat. Uh, if we do some valuations, the distributable cash flow to enterprise value is about 13 times. So not super cheap, like I said, with the uh, debt, but DCF to enterprise value is about five times. So that's about a 20% yield. Uh, now, going back to the debt, um, it, it's worth saying that this debt has been quite well managed, I think. They don't have any big maturities for another five years. Uh, the average maturity is six years. And when you listen to the investor call, what they they talk about how they think they'll get another chance at some point in the next five, six years to to roll the debt over at good rates. And I tend to believe them. I think that there is uh, a recession coming at some point. There's always a recession coming. But I think that these, these high interest rates, what they're going to do is they're eventually going to bite. We're going to see economic activity come down. And then all the central banks will drop rates as they always do to fight the economic malaise. And then what they'll do after that is I assume that Liberty Global will look for chances to push this debt further out into the future. Uh, now, I should mention that debt is a risk. This is they're, they're making no effort to pay it down, but looking at their history of acquisitions and dispositions, what they tend to do is they have some of these companies, I'm, I'm guessing they will sell off pieces of the company at some point and use the proceeds to pay down the debt. That is typically how they operate, but there is no attempt to pay down the debt in the immediate term. All right, so why would you buy this company? Let's get into the interesting bit here, which is the bull thesis and the catalyst. So I think there's a reason why this, why this price should revalue at some point in the next one to three years. Now, the biggest, most obvious thing here is the buybacks. The buybacks are massive and they're actually getting bigger. So in 2016, they had, like I said, they had 900 million shares and they are now down uh, in the low 400 millions. And by the end of 2023, they've committed to getting it down to um, less than 390 million. So they've just recently upped the buyback minimum from 10% to 15% in 2023. That is a huge amount of shares to buy back. And keep in mind, that is a minimum, right? So they're just telling you at least what they can buy back. But knowing this company, if they can, they will buy back more. They, they're going to have 1.6 billion in distributable cash flow. That's versus the uh, 8.2 billion um, market cap today. That's right around 20% uh, that they could return to shareholders. So I actually think it's probably going to land higher than 15% unless we get a spike in the stock price. Okay, so now why is that, uh, you know, buybacks are great, but why do I think this is such a great catalyst? Well, if you keep buying back that many shares, you're gonna, there's a bit of an exponential quality to it, right? So if you buy 15% of the shares back this year, if you use the same 1.6 billion next year to buy back, the percentage you can buy back is quite a lot higher, right? Because the market cap will have gone from 8.2 billion down to, let's say, oh, I don't know, a high 6 billion, so 6.8 billion, let's say. So 1.6 billion next year versus the 6.8 billion in market cap means the means the buyback percentage is over 20% and almost pushing 25%. So let's just imagine that the stock price doesn't move for three years and they continue these buybacks. They're absolutely committed to this, by the way. I should say that the at the uh, beginning of the earnings call last time, basically he said that Mike Freeze, the CEO, basically sa said, I'm paraphrasing, he says, I don't care about anything except getting the stock price up, right? So that's that's good news for you if you're a, a short-term, let's say one to five-year shareholder, because that's all he's fixated on. Oh, and by the way, he owns a million shares. So he is, he's really invested in making this work. Okay, so, but if we go back to the idea here, let's say um, you're at 390 million at the end of 2023, you buy another 80 million back for what's that, two and a half years. You've cut the, you've cut the share count in half again and if the stock price, let's say, it stays at 1850, your buyback uh, ratio goes above 30%. Now, I believe that the stock market we will revalue it 
at some point because a 30% buyback is crazy. My personal feeling is it's going to re-rate. It, it should stay in the 10 to 15% range. The stock price should adjust to that over time. Now it won't go linear. It'll go up and down around that. But I think that that might be the sweet spot. So let's say, yeah, basically if you get down to 200 million shares, the stock price could double or even triple from there just to adjust to the buybacks. Now there's a there's a little uh, other bit here that I like, and this is just a theory. I don't really know how to prove this, but I think that one of the things that's going on is who's selling their shares to the company? Well, it's the, the weaker hands, right? The paper hands. Whereas you have people like Seth Klarman and John Malone who aren't going to sell their shares back into a buyback. So right now that's 35% of the outstanding shares. And as you stop, as you, as you move through all the weaker hands, you start ending up with fewer and fewer people willing to sell their shares. So I'm personally willing to wait this out for years. If everybody just keeps selling back at $18, $20, that's fine. At some point, there's gonna, we're going to run out of sellers, right? Just assuming this all goes to plan. Now, I should say that this whole thesis is built on that distributable cash flow. If that comes down, then this idea is at risk, right? If they get, you know, let's say competition ramps up and, and the pricing war does start, or there is some kind of uh, tech uh, evolution here where people access the internet differently, you could end up with a squeeze in distributable cash flow. But on the other side of that, there's a few other bits to the few other bits to the bull uh, bull thesis and the catalyst here. Now, one of the things they talk about is that they're, what, are the, what is it? They, um, the CapEx cycle is essentially, uh, it has peaked. So the CapEx spend should be coming down over the next little while as they've, you know, finished, finished um, investing really heavily in stuff like 5G and uh, some of their biggest spends in the UK are, are done now. The other thing that is possible here is they, if you believe them, what they're talking about is that they've done all these sort of acquisitions and mergers and the synergies from those uh, moves hasn't, haven't uh, shown up yet. So they're saying they could get um, a fair bump in terms of uh, increased cash flow just from these synergies. So if you take lower CapEx and the synergies materializing, you could end up with actually distributable cash flow growing by 500, even a billion. So you'd get 2 billion, maybe 2.5 billion in distributable cash flow. And then, and then your buyback situation is even more pronounced, right? Like, let's say, let's say you get to 2 billion in um, distributable cash flow and they've bought back 30% of the shares and you're now at a $6 billion market cap well, you're up at 33% buyback. So uh, there's a lot of things that could go right here, but it, they take time. They're not super quick. It's not going to happen in two months. Now, the market might wake up to this and revalue the stock at any point, and that's why I'm buying now. But the actual process will take a little bit of time. Uh, one other positive thing I think here, now this is a bit of just of a, a theory of mine here, that the debt is actually good um, for this company in some ways. It's not, it's not obviously not good because it's so big, but uh, in an inflationary environment, uh, this big debt pile might actually serve them, right? So you have a fixed cost on the debt, like their, their, their interest rate is not floating, it's fixed at 4%. And so what that means is that as inflation runs, the, the actual value of the purchasing power value of the debt declines over time and the company is actually able to raise prices because this is basically an essential service, right? So they've shown that they can raise prices with sort of minimal churn from their customers. Um, so when you have an asset where you're able to raise prices, but the debt is staying the same level, essentially what's happening is your asset value is increasing because the cash flow is increasing and the debt is staying the same. So I think if you look at the um, intrinsic value of the company, the inflation may actually be helping them. Now, this is this only works if the inflation move is temporary, because if it's a permanent inflation move over the next five years, what's going to happen is they'll have to refinance at these higher rates, 
and then all that benefit is gone. But but I personally don't believe that we're going to see fixed inflation rates at you know five, six, ten percent. I think they're gonna I think they're gonna do this over time. And the company is smart enough that they will refinance the debt on a fixed basis um, when they get the chance. Uh, I should also mention that they have uh, currency hedged all their debt as well. So they've got that out of the equation. So I think that's it sort of for the the bull thesis. Basically the catalyst and the bull thesis is is the uh, are the buybacks, right? Eventually those will work as long as they keep them up. Otherwise, they'll just buy back the whole the whole company. Um, I'm not planning on selling back to them at $18, $18 $20. So I, I assume I'm going to benefit if I hold long enough. Um, now, the the risk side, I've mentioned them sort of here and there on this. Uh, but I think the, the biggest risk here is the discounted cash flow or the cash flows, not discounted, <laughs> distributable cash flows declining over time. Now, if those go down, this whole thing is kaput. Right, you can't. This this whole business doesn't work without cash flows. If the cash flows went down, the debt becomes a major problem because they have no way of. Well, they they have a way of services servicing it, but presumably they'd have to sell off chunks of the company to pay down the debt. The buyers would realize they're in a tough situation and they wouldn't get premium values for them. So, if the cash flow goes down, this is a jump ship situation, and I think the whole market probably is paying attention to that too. Uh, the other risk here is that there there could be a tech innovation that takes them out. Now, I, I, I can't see it. I think this stuff moves very slowly. And a, and a lot of the stuff that the, the, the tech improvements that come along, companies like Liberty Global will just just incorporate them into their offering, right? So that's that's how we've got here, right? We've got to the broadband and and mobile, which didn't exist a while ago, and they and they incorporated those new technologies into their uh, into their business. The other risk is that they make bad acquisitions because these, like I said, they don't um, they don't have a big path to organic growth, so they will keep acquiring companies and selling them, and it requires that they do that stuff quite well. Now they just uh, recently finished buying um, the remaining portion of Telenet. And I think that that was a good purchase. That's they bought low when the prices were down, and you know that shows to me that they're still uh, doing well in the game. And if you look back at the history of their acquisitions, you can see that. I mean, they show it on Wikipedia, but I'm not going to go into it here because there's too many. Anyway, that's my take on Liberty Global. If you'd like to follow me, check me out at Sharp Investing, and uh, I hope to see you guys in next month on Contrarian Quarter.